we have the results from Dixville, and they are as follows. For president, George Bush, Dan Quayle, 34 votes. Michael Dukakis, Lloyd Benson, three votes. And one write in for Jack Kemp. just received a telephone call from Governor Dukakis. He was, most, he was most gracious. His call was personal. It was genuinely friendly. And we can now, we can now speak the most majestic words a democracy has to offer. The people have spoken. Thank you, New Hampshire. Thanks for everything, and God bless America. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Just a few minutes ago, I called Vice President Bush and congratulated him on his victory. And I know I speak for all of you and for all the American people when I say that he will be our president and we'll work with him. This nation faces major challenges ahead and we must work together. To George and Barbara Bush and their family, we say congratulations. We did win one for the Gipper. We fought fair, and we never quit. And we never lost our faith in the truth. That's what you need in a campaign. I have never seen a candidate that worked any harder or in those last three or four weeks delivered a message any stronger than did Mike Dukakis in those closing days. And he made me proud to be his president. Thank you all. Good morning, and I hope everybody had a good night's sleep. I did not. I talked to Secretary of State George Shultz this morning, and he told me that he enthusiastically endorsed my choice for the next Secretary of State. As his successor, it is my intention to name uh, James A. Baker III. I first persuaded Jim Baker to leave Houston and come to Washington many years ago in the Ford administration. Uh, when he first came up to the Commerce Department. And since then, he has distinguished himself in every position that he has held. Mr. Vice President, what kind of job will you give Dan Quayle in your administration? Will he have the same access to the, uh, uh, all the papers that uh, you saw from President Reagan, what he'll do? I haven't fo uh, formulated in the detail, but certainly he will have access to the papers, access to the intelligence, access to the information, because it is essential that a Vice President uh, be up to speed on every sensitive matter involving the government, uh, lest something happen to the president. You said a few days ago, but haven't mentioned since, that you're going to be trying to seek an early meeting with uh, uh, Mr. Gorbachev. Now that you've named uh, 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 Jim Baker, do you expect that he will begin at some point soon to try to seek that meeting? Not before January 20th. 
And what I said would, I would have the secretary meet with the NATO leaders, uh, his counterparts in NATO, and that then he would meet with Mr. Shevardnadze, and that then he would make clear to uh, the Soviets that I would be willing to meet with Mr. Gorbachev, and that is about the way. But I don't think, Saul, that would start, you know, before the president, uh, before I become president of the United States. Your job? Well, of course, the president is the man who sets the foreign policy, as always. And I think it's important that the Secretary of State be close to the president. And we're fortunate to have this team of President Bush and Secretary Baker as two people who have had, over a long period of time, the closest kind of working relationship. The Vice President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. Accompanied by Senator and Mrs. Quayle. We are open now to new progress and to new challenges. And to those who do not yet view themselves as our allies, well, we'll keep on trying. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Well, this is not the end of an era, but a time to refresh and strengthen our new beginning. In fact, to those who sometimes flatter me with talk of a Reagan revo revolution, today my hope is this. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I really believe that the results would have been entirely different if we hadn't had this loyal, steadfast campaign support, and I know they would, if I hadn't, hadn't learned from a giant the good things about the United States of America. Thank you, sir. Why is this man smiling? Because he's the president-elect? Wrong. He's smiling because for the next four years, he'll be excused from doing all sorts of perfectly silly things to get people to vote for him. Why does this man seem so relieved? Because for one thing, at least for a while, he won't have to dance with any more junior prom queens. We do demand too much of our candidates. We demand they make fools of themselves in public. We make them wear funny hats. Lots of hats. We demand they eat liver and onions and like it, and seem interested with whatever we have to show and tell. We demand they cradle babies and kiss dogs and do Roy Rogers and Dale Evans imitations when called upon. We demand, in short, they spend at least a year embarrassing themselves. Now it's over, and one of them gets to be leader of the free world, and the other doesn't, and both of them get to salvage what remains of their dignity. Why is this man in such good spirits? He's just been re-elected to the Senate, and it'll be six years before he has to confront another corned beef on rye. How do I eat this? With pleasure, Senator, with pleasure. 